Now you can see me. Now you can see me. Now. Correct? We're broadcasting right from home. Um, somehow I thought I had started it, but I uh, hadn't started it. So anyway, just let me, give me a, send me a chat to know you can see me. Oh, good. Welcome. Uh, tonight's going to be a relaxed class because I'm very relaxed. I've, um, I've just been on a 10-day tour. We went to Vancouver 10 days ago. We did a Japa workshop Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday night, we did Kirtan at a yoga studio. Sunday night, we did Kirtan at the temple. I don't, I don't know how many people, 500, 800. It was a wonderful Kirtan. I can't say it was wonderful. I was leading it. That's proud. But anyway, it was wonderful. Kirtan is always wonderful. The next morning, we left about 5.30 and drove to a farm in Vancouver called Sharanagati. And there we did two days of a forgiveness workshop. And then we came back Wednesday morning to Vancouver. And then I flew out to a place called Wichita, Kansas. And then Thursday night we did a program. And then Friday I drove to Kansas City and all day Saturday we did a forgiveness workshop in a yoga studio. And then Sunday, I drove back to Wichita and we did a forgiveness introduction at a Universalist Unitarian Church. And you don't have to believe in God to go to that church. Interesting. And then I left Monday and came back to Alachua, arriving 10.30 last night, staying overnight by the airport, which is an hour and a half drive, and here I am. And... I'm leaving for India next Monday, and I rented my house, and we're moving everything out. It's all a total mess, and I have all these things to do, and I wish you were all here helping me, because I'm losing my mind, almost. Anyway, but Ajinkya is happy because we'll see him. Anyway. We are continuing, if you remember, the last class I gave was two weeks ago. And it was, the, I believe, the third class we're giving on the topic of taste. Is taste important? If so, why? How do we get it? What's the difference between taste and sense gratification? So, well, welcome, Leslie. So... Um, something interesting that came up when I was doing a little, just uh, fooling around on the airplane. Leslie is here. She, she's from Vancouver. So, um, that's very nice that you're here. So, I was um, on the plane doing a little research, uh, looking at some verses, and there's a verse in the uh, Bhagavatam. In fact, I will read it because I have it here on my computer. And some of you may know this. If you don't know it, it is... Let's see if I have the verse written down. It is Srimad Bhagavatam 3, 3rd Canto, 25th chapter, 25th verse, if you want to look at it. And it's a, it's a fairly well-known verse, if you know verses. It goes like this. Satam prasanga mama virya samvido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana kata tajoshanat ashvaparga vartmani shadaratir bhakti anukramishyati. And the translation. The spiritually powerful message of Godhead can be properly discussed only in a society of devotees. And it is greatly pleasing to hear in that association. If one hears from devotees, the way of transcendental experience quickly opens, and gradually one attains firm faith that in due course develops into attraction and devotion. So if you look at this verse, you'll find some interesting things that relate to this discussion. And 
One of the things it said in this verse, I don't know if you picked it, picked up on it, but it is greatly pleasing to hear in that association. So the word pleasing stands out because we're talking about taste. And um, another word, rasa ayana, a source of sweetness. So greatly pleasing to hear, a source of sweetness. And ritkarna, sweet to the ears. Just like some of you know, there's a devotee who's quite well known in the yoga circles for her kirtan and bhajan. Her name is Karna Amrita. So Karna Amrita means nectar for the ear. Rit Karna. The heart of Bhavanti, Rit Karna Rasayana. So Karna Amrita are Karna Rasayana, a source of sweetness for the ears. So the thing that... Um, I find interesting, and there's another verse or another explanation, how it becomes pleasing in the association of devotees. And let's see what Prabhupada says. Um, one, there's one thing that he says which is interesting. And I don't think it's in this purport, but I think it's in another one. Um, where Prabhupada says that devotional service cannot be um, perfectly relishable without the association of devotees. And I think we all know this, but what I was thinking is, what's interesting is that Prabhupada uses the word relishable and as, as in, this, in this context, relishable meaning, uh, it, it sounds like the way Prabhupada's saying it, relishable means it's an end, it's a goal. You cannot be perfectly relishable without the association of devotees. So, I mean, think about that. We need association of devotees. And then Prabhupada saying, we need association for the message of Krishna or Krishna consciousness in general to be relishable. So that means that it being relishable is a goal for all devotees. And the word relishable, I don't even believe it's an English word. Would someone like to check if you have a dictionary or go online right now and check and see if Relish a bull, which which I assume would be spelled relish with a a b l e at the end. Relishable, maybe it's spelled differently, and that's why I don't think it's a a real word. Word, but I, my guess is that Prabhupada made it up, and he uses the word quite often, and he uses it in the sense that relishable is a goal. It's um a goal, but you could say it's a, how do we want to say it? It's, it's like a benchmark or a landmark of Krishna, Krishna consciousness. That if things are going well in Krishna consciousness, if we're hearing or we're chanting well, it should be relishable or the, that's what we're looking for. That's a sign of health. Here, uh, Prabhupada says, in the Anjalila. Uh, no, no, not the Anjalila. This must be a letter. I see that you have acquired a taste for hearing talks regarding Krishna. Therefore, you are extremely fortunate. Not only you, but anyone who has awakened such a taste is considered most fortunate. So, so therein we can see it's a goal of Krishna consciousness and it's a stage of Krishna consciousness. And as we're going, gradually elevating ourselves, we come to this point where we get a taste and that's a sign that things are going well, that we're doing good. And, you know, you know, you have these verses like Machitta uh, Makata Prana Bodhiyantas Parasparam That's Bhagavad Gita. They, they, devotees always, uh, their minds are engaged in me, they are discussing me. Machitta Makata Prana Bodhiyantas Parasparam They're speaking Nita Nita. They're always. It's it's basically the same idea. They're talking. They're realizing. They're relishing. Uh, sometimes we have the um, analogy of churning the ocean of nectar. You know, like you churn milk, or you churn fresh milk. The cream comes to the top. You churn the cream. Have any of you ever churn cream? You get butter. Um, we got the opportunity to churn cream into butter in Vrindavan with the traditional way that they do it, where you pull. You have a rope 
around a piece of wood and the bottom of the piece of wood is um, some apparatus that will churn the butter. And so you pull it like this. And it's really good exercise if you want a six-pack ab. I mean, like, you know, if you're living in Hollywood and you want to play the part and you get a six-pack ab, just churn butter out of milk, out of cream. You're good to go. Um, in those days, people didn't have to go to gyms because they were all working, using their bodies. Um, so, churning the ocean of nectar, another saying. So did, did anybody, I'm going to go back to chat. I'm not did anybody find this word relishable? Let's see what you say. No problem. Relishable, relishable is in the English dictionary. See, Rama. Look, the, look, uh, um, can you guys look in the American dictionary? <laughs> Maybe it's a British word. Is there such a thing as British words that don't show up in American dictionaries? Just to show you how ignorant I am. If you can f go online and find a American Dictionary. Look it up. I'd like to know. I thought Prabhupada created that word. Anyway, it's a perfectly good word. We can use it. So, Prabhupada, Prabhupada uses the word. Hold on a second. Girashwami is in uh, Alachua, and I left him a message to call me. He might call during the show. I have my phone on. If he calls, I'm going to have to answer it and just tell him. I'll call him back after because he's leaving tomorrow. So that's okay. Wow, it's not in the Oxford American Dictionary. Good, I'm not that stupid after all. We learned something tonight that maybe only us few know that relishable is a British word and it's not in the American Dictionary. Interesting, isn't it? So... <laughs> so Prabhupada um, uses the word relishable here in the verse pleasing to the ear let's just um, read the purport just see what he says this verse appears in the Srimad Bhagavatam this is actually quoted in the Chaitanya Charitamrita so you could find this verse in the Bhagavatam and, and read a different purport than what we're reading now because I'm reading as far as I know, I'm reading, yeah, I'm reading the purport from the Chaitanya Charitamrita because uh, Prabhupada's saying this appears in the Bhagavatam. Uh, where Kapila Dev replies to the questions of his mother Devahuti about the process of devotional service. As one advances in devotional activities, the process becomes progressively clearer and more encouraging. Unless one gets this spiritual encouragement by following, by following the instructions of the spiritual master, it is not possible to make advancement. Therefore, one's development of a taste for executing these instructions is the test of one's devotional service. Okay, let's rewind. Yeah, I want to explain that. It's interesting. I'm going to read the last two sentences. Three sentences and explain them. As one advances in devotional activities, the process becomes progressively clearer and more encouraging. What does that mean? Well, it means a few things. We're getting realization, which is encouraging, which means it's becoming clear, but realization also means that Krishna is revealing himself because it's Krishna who's giving the realization. And it also means progressively clearer and more encouraging. Why do we become encouraged in devotional service? Because we're experiencing something transcendental. Correct? We're experiencing something transcendental. That's encouraging, isn't it? It means that Krishna is real. Whenever we get a realization that Krishna is there, Krishna is real in our lives, He's affecting our lives, He's allowing us to experience something of the relationship. He's guiding us in some way. It's encouraging. The opposite is discouraging, and that's why we become discouraged, right? If there's no realization, if there's no experience, we become discouraged. Where's Krishna? Where's Krishna in my life? And 
we often this often happens because we're committing offenses to other devotees to the holy name or we're not executing the instructions that Srila Prabhupada has given us. So then the opposite becomes true. Say as one advances, as one does not advance in devotional service, the process becomes progressively unclear and discouraging. Okay, let's read on. Unless one gets this spiritual encourage, encouragement by following the instructions of the spiritual master, it is not possible to make advancement. This is interesting, isn't it? Because what Prabhupada is saying, unless Krishna is in some way revealing himself to us through guiding us, through giving us realization, through experience, then what does Prabhupada say? It's not possible to make advancement. Where's the impetus to make advancement? Because if there's not some experience in Krishna consciousness, then what do we want? We all want experience. We can't live without experience. Boredom um, is probably pretty close to... Um, I was just thinking, not suicide, but if you had to experience boredom 24-7, you would probably become suicidal, wouldn't you? And sometimes in Krishna consciousness, at least you'd probably think, think about killing yourself, you wouldn't be able... Boredom is one of the most difficult things to tolerate. So in Krishna consciousness, we don't want to end up in boredom without an experience of Krishna. So Prabhupada is saying, unless one gets this spiritual encourage, encouragement uh, by following the instructions of the spiritual master, it's not possible to make advancement. Isn't that interesting? There's no, there's no impetus. There's no nectar. There's no relish. So these things are um, important. They're not... As we've said before, they're not forms of sense gratification, but they're, they're items of bhakti, they're byproducts of advancing in devotional service, and they're also part of the process of devotional service, where we discuss about Krishna and we relish, as Prabhupada talks about, it's another um, statement Prabhupada makes, relish the mellow. So we talk and we relish the mellow, or we go to a kirtan and we say, it was relishable. So what does that mean? It, it means there was an experience of Krishna and Krishna is sweet and Krishna is relishable. That's what we mean. We don't mean we were relishing sense gratification. Well, sense gratification just puts us in the position of God. Relishing the mellow does not put us in the position of God. It, we remain in the position of servant. Correct? So... Let's relish. Let's churn prabhus, matajis. Let's churn the ocean of nectar. Let's relish Krishna kata, hari kata, katam rita, hari katam rita, the nectar of the subjects of Krishna. Let us relish. Let us churn the ocean. And we relish especially in the association of devotees because then this is how we can fully churn the ocean discussing Krishna, just sharing our realizations. It's the process. I'll tell you a story. I first went to uh, Vrindavan in 1975. And we went on a tour of the Radha Damodar Temple. And Radha Damodar Temple, you, it has many um, small samadhi tombs of Vaishnavas, maybe like 30. And so you, you leave the temple room and you go out in the courtyard to your left, and there are these samadhis. And then you go around the samadhis, behind them, and then you walk towards the Bhajan Kutir and Samadhi of Rupa Goswami. And on the way, there's a little area. And so, I don't know if it's there now, but when I first went there, the tour guide said, this area is where the Goswamis sat and discussed Krishna. And he said, and this was their highest service. It's interesting. Because often, when we discuss Krishna in the association of devotees, we have breakthroughs and realizations that we otherwise wouldn't have. And I don't know if you experience this. I'm sure you all must have experienced this. That sometimes, 
you know, you've read a lot of things and you're trying to put them in place and figure them out and everything's not exactly clear. And you start discussing it with devotees and it becomes clear. And you go, oh, this is, now I understand what this means. And that's why Prabhupada's saying this. And sometimes um, Prabhupada would, would read something and he'd bring up a topic and he would say, so discuss. You know, there'd be the group of devotees and he'd say, discuss. And he would listen. He want them to discuss, churn the ocean, because um, we, they get realization from discussing, they get breakthroughs, they get insights. Same reason Prabhupada said, write every day. In the, in the CC, Prabhupada said, you don't write to become a published author, you write for your own purification. So through writing, we get realization, as we do through talking about Krishna consciousness to people who are new to Krishna consciousness, we get many, many realizations. And so, speaking about Krishna is also part of our sadhana. It's a, it's a practice which is not only good for the people we're speaking to, it's also good for us. And we also get realizations by speaking. Okay, so let's read on. Therefore, one's development of a taste for executing these instructions is the test of one's devotional service. Wow. In other words, Prabhupada saying, how do you know you're making advancement? Well, you know you're making advancement as we discussed before because your senses are becoming purified. So how do you know your senses are becoming purified? Because Krishna becomes more attractive. I'll tell you a nice story. We had a Japa retreat uh, maybe four or five years ago. And I am in Florida. If you go 350 miles north of Florida, you come to Atlanta, Georgia. All of you in India and England, get out your maps here. Just straight north. And then if you go north of Atlanta for about an hour and a half or two, you go up in the mountains. They're called the Blue Ridge Mountains. So in these Blue Ridge Mountains, there's a healing school come retreat center. And it's very interesting. They have a dome-shaped meeting center that might hold a few hundred people. And on each side of, uh, on different sides of the dome they have little bhajan kutir so like you imagine a a dome like this and then coming out of the dome little rooms and then in the top of the dome it's glass and the sunlight comes through and right where the sunlight comes through they they have a hole in the floor with glass over it and there's crystals on it and then outside this building they have a beautiful fountain i'm just i'm just trying to give you a and it's high in the mountains, just trying to give you a vision of kind of the atmosphere of this place. Now I totally forgot what I was, the point I was making. Uh, I had to do something with experience, oh yeah. So, Prabhu, this is what happens when you get old. You forget what you're talking about. And I'm not even that old. So, we are, just, I want to give you a, like, like a little experience of what it's like so you could better understand the story. We arrive on Wednesday night. You're, you're in the mountains. We are um, from Alachua. We're 450 miles away. If you think in kilometers, um, what's, what is that? Like 100 and, you know, 600 kilometers away, something like that. From home. In the mountains... Rivers flowing by, and it's only devotees. There were, at that time, maybe 30 of us. Kind of sounds nice, doesn't it? We arrive Wednesday night. We eat. We get our rooms. The rooms are beautiful. Wood floors, wood walls, overlooking the river, trees all around. Would you like to come? You want to go? You want to go on a retreat like that? Pack your bags. Let's go. So, um, Sorry. Kicking the computer. So, Wednesday night, we meet. Sachinanda Swami is there. I was there. I think that time, Girash Swami may have been there, or Mother Narayani. Good association. Bhattahari was there. A lot of second generation devotees were there. It was, you know, just, there you are. You're going to be there till Sunday afternoon, only with devotees. Basically, from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to sleep at night, you're just with devotees. So Friday, fully immersed in chanting and learning about the Holy Name. Thursday, excuse me. 
Friday, fully immersed in hearing and chanting about the Holy Name. Saturday, 64 rounds. No talking. So it's like two days to prepare. Now you're in this ideal environment. Only devotees. You spent two days just focusing on improving your japa. Now you take a vow of silence. There's nobody to talk to. Even when you eat, you don't talk. What's there to do? What everyone else is doing. 64 rounds. It's not difficult in that environment. That evening, Dravida Prabhu. Some of you may know Dravida if you've ever heard uh, tapes of him reciting shlokas and mantras in a very musical way. He chants shlokas like that. In a unique way. I, I don't know anyone else who chants that way. So he did a slideshow. And he had all these pictures of Krishna and deities that I've seen before. And he had verses. And he put a lot of these verses into English poetry and he would read them. Almost uh, became like a, like a rap song sometimes. And then at one point, Anapayani, who is a famous dancer in ISKCON, and she has a dance school here, and all the girls in Latch would go to her dance school, or most of them, the young girls. And she was like spontaneously dancing. Like with, and then you have the pictures of Krishna, she's dancing, she's looking at them. So this is the evening of the 64 round day, and I'm looking at these pictures of Krishna, and I'm telling myself, I've seen these pictures before, so many times, but now, they're so much more attractive. I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at Krishna in his, you know, his threefold bending form. How does he do it? I can't imitate him, I'm not good at playing God, fortunately. And so he's bent like that. And we're looking at his pictures, and I'm looking at him, Looking at the picture, that form, the way Krishna is bending, the way he's looking, it's so beautiful, it's so attractive. And I never felt that kind of attraction before. So that was the result of chanting 64 rounds. That's what happens. The senses become purified. All of a sudden, everything about Krishna is more attractive. He looks more attractive. Hearing his um, instructions or hearing about his activities become more tasteful, more attractive. Chanting his name becomes more attractive. It's the same thing with Maya. The more we're in Maya, the more Maya is attractive. Do you ever ever notice how sometimes you're attracted to things, like intensely attracted? It seems like out of nowhere. And you're thinking to yourself, last week I wasn't attracted to that. This week, that looks so much more attractive than it did last week. What's going on? It's the same thing. What's going on is internally, there's more of an appetite for it. So it works both ways. So I'm going to read the last statement, which was the catalyst for what I just said. One's development of a taste for executing these instructions is the test of one's devotional service. That's how we know we're progressing in Krishna consciousness. We all know this. When we first became devotees, there was a point, it's kind of like the uh-oh point. What was that uh-oh point? Um, the things I used to do are no longer relishable. It's like um, the taste has been chewed out of the gum and I'm doing the same thing I always did and I used to get some taste and now I don't. Oh, this Krishna consciousness is working. What do I do now? Where do I go? Oh, I guess I better get more into Krishna consciousness because the material stuff is not working anymore. I mean, I used to like doing this, I used to like doing that, and I'm really not interested in it anymore. That's how you know Krishna consciousness is working, isn't it? And it happened to all of us. That's why we're devotees. If that didn't happen, how could we be devotees? We'd be out doing what we always did. But that's also how we know when we're not in Krishna consciousness, because things become attractive. Even the things that we renounce, they become attractive. Again, not always, not for everyone, but sometimes. It happens. I'm sure you've all experienced that. That should be the real uh-oh, uh-oh, something's wrong. This is becoming attractive. I need... 
to relish Krishna consciousness. I need to churn the ocean of nectar. I need to find a devotee and talk to them about Krishna. No, I don't need to find a devotee to complain to. I need a devotee to talk to about Krishna. Okay. Initial, so let's read on. I'm going to go back. Um, I'm not on the chat page. I'm going to go back and see if you have questions. Prabhupada says, Initially, one must develop confidence by hearing the science of devotion from a qualified spiritual master. Then, as he associates with devotees and tries to adopt the means instructed by the spiritual master in his own life, his misgivings and other obstacles are vanquished by his execution of devotional service. Strong attachment for the transcendental service of the Lord develops as he continues listening to the messages of God. And if he steadfastly proceeds, in this way he is certainly elevated to spontaneous love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So now what is Prabhupada saying? Okay, as he associates with devotees, in, in Prabhupada in the verse is saying, in the association of devotees, Krishna, the Hari Kata becomes nectar, sweet, uh, Devotional service cannot be relishable, cannot be perfect, cannot be successful without the association of devotees, Prabhupada says. So as he associates, with, which means as he continues to associate, and tries to adopt the means instructed by the spiritual master, his misgivings and other obstacles are vanquished by his execution of devotional service. Then what happens? So here, we talked about this last week. The misgivings go away. What are, what are the misgivings? The misgivings are anarthas. What are the anarthas? Anarthas is anything that gets in the way of our relationship with Krishna. And, I mean, if you wanted to boil the Anarthas down, really, they boil down to just selfishness. That, uh, I want to be happy, I want to enjoy, and uh, I don't really care if Krishna enjoys or not. I just want to enjoy, I want to be happy. So, that's the root of the Anarthas. So, as we advance in devotional service, we think more about Krishna's pleasure than we think about our pleasure. And then what happens? What does Prabhupada say? Um... These anarthas become vanquished by bhakti, by this, and then attachment develops. Because with unless the anarthas go away, there's, you, you can't go to the stage of attraction and attachment. Because those anarthas are like they're nasty if you think about it. Because kind of like you know when you glue something. They say, clean the surface. Well, if you have a lot of dust or dirt on something, then the glue's not going to stick well. And Arthur's are something like that. It's like, Krishna, the, no, it's like, it's like, it's like the soul and Krishna have a magnetic, dump that last analogy or go to a better one. The soul and Krishna have a magnetic attraction, but sometimes you can put something, right? And it blocks the magnetic attraction. That which blocks the magnetic attraction is called an artha. On artha, something which is not needed. It's definitely, it, that's an understatement, it's not needed. It's actually getting in the way of the relationship. So when you pull, so there's this magnetic attraction and now there's something getting in the way, so you don't feel it. You pull it away and it, there's this magnetic attraction to Krishna that we all have, which is so wonderful to meditate on, especially when we feel very far away from Krishna and we feel sometimes hopeless, sometimes useless, sometimes unworthy, uh, and sometimes even fearful that we'll never be Krishna conscious, it's very encouraging to think, no, there's a natural attraction between ourselves and Krishna. It's not artificial. I mean, this attraction for Maya is artificial. It seems natural, but it's artificial. So the natural attraction is there. So all Prabhupada's saying is, well, if you do this process, the natural attraction comes because the anarthas will go away. And last week we spoke, or two weeks ago we spoke about how taste actually is like an acid which eats away the anarthas. <clears throat> and simultaneously, interestingly, we don't get the taste uh, because the anarthas block it. But Lord Chaitanya is so kind and the holy name is so powerful that even in spite of these anarthas, something leaks in enough will leak in to encourage us to go one more day. I'll do it again tomorrow. Like they say in 12-step programs. Um, someone just told me they were in the 12-step 12 12 12 step program and they say, 
Don't worry about tomorrow. Just don't drink today. Take it one day at a time. Just get through today. So just get through today, Prabhus. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. That's that's the idea. Okay. Prabhupada goes on. Strong attachment for the transcendental service of the Lord develops as he continues listening to the messages of Godhead. So this is going to happen. It's natural. And if he steadfastly proceeds in this way, he is certainly elevated to spontaneous love for the Supreme Personality of God. So basically, Prabhupada is saying, here's a process. It works. And how do you know it's working? It's becoming more attractive. How do you know it's not working? It's not becoming attractive. And that's why I say again and again, and I'll probably say it, I'll probably inscribe this on my tombstone, if we don't get a taste for chanting, or if we don't, I would say not that. I don't say it that way. If we don't try to chant properly, we will not get a taste. And if we don't get a taste, at some point, we are going to stop chanting. And I make this point in my. It's an interesting point. I make this point in my Japa workshops. Prabhupada used to say, I don't know, Leslie, if I made this point. Maybe you can tell me. I'm going to go back to the chat so you can let me know when you hear it, if I made this point um, in Vancouver. So, Prabhupada used to make, uh, used to, um, i got to join the chat again, I was timed out. I feel so unwanted, they timed me out. So, Prabhupada makes this point, you can chant Hare Krishna, 24 hours a day, he said, and people say, but oh, it's just it's just brain hypnotizing, it's nothing, you know, you chant anything and you believe it's doing something in the prophet. He said, then chant Coca-Cola and see if you can chant that 24 hours a day. You can't, you'll get bored. Coca-Cola, 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 Coca-Cola. You want to try? Get out your beads, Prabhu's. Coca Cola, 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 real effort, without real devotion, where there's no taste, then really it's not that much, the experience is not a whole lot different than the experience one would get from chanting Coca-Cola, 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 Coca-Cola. Unless Coke and Cola are in Sanskrit, I don't know. If they're in Sanskrit, then we have to change it to something else. But if they're not in Sanskrit, then, uh, yeah, I did make the point. Uh, Leslie said I made the point. It's an interesting point because I think for many devotees, their experience with the holy name, if, it, if they're not chanting properly, is very similar to the experience that they would have chanting anything because it's just external. It's, Krishna's not there. It's just an external sound. So that's why if we are conscious of the importance of relishing, um, relishing our chanting, relishing our service, find something in Krishna consciousness that you really like to do, that inspires you. And don't focus on things that will bring you down because you're not going to get a taste that way. So we we don't want to be selfish, but we want to be selfish. And I'll explain why. And then I'll read your questions. In the early days of the movement, a devotee asked Prabhupada, should I desire to go back to Godhead? And why did he ask that question? Because Prabhupada says in his books we should, but there's a doubt that that's not pure devotional service, right? We should, because Prabhupada says that also. A devotee thinks it's sense gratification to go back to Godhead, to have that desire. So there's a confusion. So he asked Prabhupada, should I desire to go back to Godhead? And Prabhupada said, yes, you should. And you might think, but that's selfish. No, but for that devotee in that early stage of Krishna consciousness with the realizations he had, that desire was helping him. Or you could say that desire was necessary. 
absolutely necessary to motivate and inspire him in Krishna consciousness. So, the desire to get a taste, the desire to relish Krishna consciousness, the desire to be happy in Krishna consciousness is not in and of itself a bad desire if that is a desire to keep us advancing. If that's Krishna, please give me a taste so I can continue advancing in Krishna consciousness. Please let me relish the chanting. Please let me relish the service or find a service, inspire me to, to take up a service that's relishable that will make me happy because if I'm happy, I'm not going anywhere. Sometimes Prabhupada would say, what do you want to do? Now I could give a whole lecture about completely surrendering and just doing whatever Krishna wants. That's also Krishna consciousness. But it's not Krishna consciousness when we come to a point where we're miserable. We need to be inspired. We need to find service that inspires us because if we do, our chanting is going to be more inspired and we'll inspire other people. And that's why it's so important. If things are not going well, don't focus on them because if you focus on them, what happens? It brings your consciousness down. It's okay to see that things are not going well. That's, that's okay. But to focus on it, how bad things are, it's not good. You want to focus on things which are what? Relishable. Another word Prabhupada uses, juicy. Focus on the juicy. Sometimes a devotee will recite a verse and another devotee will say, that verse is juicy. <coughs> you ever heard that? It's kind of the devotee lingo. Lingo, lingo, Prabhu. That was a juicy verse. What does that mean? Is it full of nectar? We should become full of nectar. That's, you know, don't feel bad nectarizing yourself. You need it. If you don't nectarize yourself, you may not be around next year because you'll be nectarizing yourself with Maya if you don't nectarize yourself with Krishna. It's just, it's just true. I, I don't know how to say it other than it's true. That's just the way things are. Krishna is attractive. And Maya is Krishna's energy. She's attractive. She's very attractive. You know how attractive she is. But when you're Krishna conscious, it's like, eh, Big deal. Because Krishna is more attractive. Right? But if we're not attracted to Krishna, then what defense do we have? I think I was saying last week, or maybe in a class this past week, that I was listening to a, a morning walk and one devotee was telling Prabhupada, he said, so many of these priests, Catholic priests, are falling down or becoming homosexuals, having girlfriends. Prabhupada said, they must fall down. He said, unless there's a taste, unless they're becoming purified and getting a taste, they must, excuse me, they must fall down. Interesting. Okay. So, we have a comment or question from TJ. Welcome, TJ. What does it mean, then, when we hear we are marginal energy? Marginal energy means you have, you are superior, but you have a choice to be overcome by the inferior. And we must be marginal. If there's no choice, there's no real love. So Krishna gives us independence. Krishna is the superior... Uh, sometimes it's said that jiva is the superior energy, but really there is an energy above the jiva. And then the jiva is marginal, spiritual, but marginal, which means prone to either be attracted by Krishna or be attracted by Maya. And in Shastra, it says the attraction for Maya takes place when we turn our back on Krishna. We just turn around and then you see Maya. If you didn't turn around, you wouldn't see Maya, you would see Krishna. Yes. Okay. I'm going to wait a minute. Welcome, Brenda Lee. Christina. Pranapriya. What a nice name. The life and dear. When is the life, the dearest in the life of Krishna or Guru? And Bhakti and Carol, welcome. Divyangi Ukrishta. Krishna, where are you from? India. If so, what state? I'd be interested. Maybe I know you and I don't realize it. Um, if I ever see any of you and I don't recognize you, you're going to say, no, but I went to that workshop with the other 300 devotees six years ago. You must remember me. 
I wish I could. I remember a lot, but not everything. Um, Bhakti Carol asks, what do you think about avoiding negative people? I mean, seriously scary negative, yeah. I think we should all avoid negative people. Unless, well, it, it depends what you mean by avoiding. Avoiding friendship. Unless you can help them, they might bring you down otherwise. Of course, if you're trying to give other people Krishna consciousness, you meet a lot of negative people. So there's a difference between associating, like, like Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that, Christina, oh yeah, Vancouver, of course. There's so many Christinas. No, there was another one, Catherine. Yeah, I'm getting mixed up here. So. I'm so tired. You guys work me so hard. I'll never forgive you. I'll have to take my forgiveness seminar to forgive you for working me so hard. Oh, oh okay. Those Christas in Delhi. Oh, from Delhi, okay. Christina, welcome. Nice you're here. Oh, she had to leave. Oh. Um, so the question, yeah, so, um, oh, Pranapriya, yes, of course. I should have known. She attended the Japa workshop in Tawakam. Thank you for coming. So, uh, I'll tell you what Bhakti Vinod Thakur said about association. Because Carol's asking, well, what about associating with, like, really, really negative people? But of course, my general answer is... Um, we have to see how we're affected by association. And um, if we're being neg negatively affected by some people, uh, affected in a way that it's disturbing our mind or disturbing our Krishna consciousness, then unless we have to, have to associate, if we have the choice not to, then definitely we shouldn't. But I want to explain what Bhakti Vinod Thakur said about association, because... He was addressing the point that naturally, by living, we have family members, we have a broader family, we have uh, co-workers, we just interact with people. So he said, when the scripture says, don't associate with non-devotees, that doesn't mean don't talk to people, don't look at them. Although in some religious traditions, that's how they deal with it. I'm in Israel, and I tell you, the uh, Hasidics, they don't want to hang out with you, because... They think you're a bad association. They don't even look at you. Huh? That's the impression I get, that they just want to stay aloof from you. And I could understand why, that in most cases, that they would want to. But they don't know about devotees. Devotees are a good association. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, intimate association means the exchanges of love, which we find in the nectar of instruction. Particularly, you know, where you're revealing your heart, you're opening up very deeply in making these deep friendships. And um, he said, on that level, there's this osmosis going on where you pick up on other people's nature and qualities. And we all know this just by being around people. I mean, you definitely know it when you're around someone who's Krishna conscious. You become inspired, you pick up on it. And you know, if somebody is really materialistic, just by sitting with them, you could be affected just by their thoughts. I'm sure you've experienced that also. So, you know, Shastra is pretty strong about the importance of associating with devotees and about the importance of avoiding bad association. We had this thing when we were hippies. The hippie, hippies had this thing where they would say, if somebody was high, and during hippie days, somebody was always high in your group of friends. And if you hung out with this person who was high, you would also get high without the drug by association. And they called it a contact high. So just like you get a contact high when you associate with a very ele elevated devotee, you get a contact low when you associate with someone who's very low. Because their mind, their heart is operating on a certain level. Interesting, there's a verse, um, it's probably the Bhagavatam. I mean, it... It may not even be, I'm not sure. But there's a verse, Lord Chaitanya said, he said, well, he said, what's the behavior of, how do you know the behavior of a Vaishnava? He said, he said, you know, what does a Vaishnava do? What's, what's, his, what's the main thing? He said, he doesn't associate with non-devotees. That's the main thing. And then there's another verse, he said, 
he said it's actually worse to associate you see, for a man for a renunciate associating intimately with a woman um, is worse than suicide because he may end up falling down kill himself at least he didn't fall down not that we recommend killing yourself but as a principle philosophical principle we can understand but then he said it's actually worse for a man to associate with a man who is attached to women than to associate with a woman because by associating with a man who is attached he'll become more disturbed than he would by being with a woman he may not even be that disturbed by being with a woman or being disturbed at all maybe there's no attraction there but by being with a man who's talking about it and it he becomes disturbed and there's a funny story that Sachinanda Swami tells and I, maybe I mentioned this before but it's worth mentioning it's kind of funny um, yeah you can feel the energy the good or bad contact low yeah. hey I'm getting a contact low by hanging out with you get away from me take a walk or you run away um, we can just call uh, if we want to be polite, we should say, this person is in higher consciousness, high energy, high vibration, Krishna consciousness. This person is low energy, low vibration. There's a lot of low vibrational people around. Uh, they hang out at uh, McDonald's, don't they? In similar places. Anyway, interesting story. We're, we're making this point about Mahaprabhu saying, even more disturbing to be with a man who is attached to a woman than to be with a woman. So Satchinanda Swami was giving, was giving once upon a time a Brahmacharya class. I don't know if these are popular, but when I was younger in Krishna consciousness, occasionally we would have a class just for men, uh, and particularly for single men. And, and the idea was, at least in those days, the early days of ISKCON, so I'll give you some history. In the early days of ISKCON, the goal for young men joining, for most of them, was to remain brahmacharis. So that was kind of like, okay, you've joined, you renounced, you gave up your girlfriend, so just remain a brahmachari. You know, it's simpler. So men would join with, with unrealistic goals about celibacy, many of them, most of them. And then they would be encouraged, you know, just keep it simple, live with the brahmacharis, maybe someday you'll take sannyas, just be a preacher, renounce, travel, you know, as a brahmachari, you can travel with the sannyasis, you can preach Krishna consciousness, you can serve Krishna. So, no doubt, good advice, but not always everyone could do that. But anyway, the point of me mentioning this was that in those days, you would get the men together, and you would have a brahmacharya class about how to remain brahmacharya. You wouldn't have a class for women how to remain brahmacharini because women all like to get married and most women need to be married. It's good for them. They have a husband. He guides them. They have children. It's just their nature. It's totally normal. So very, very, very rarely would a woman ever join and think, I'm not getting married, I'm not having kids, I just want to be like a nun. That happens, but not usually. But when the men join, even if they're not capable, at least in those days, they often thought, this is what I'm going to do. So you'd have these classes. Ladies, don't get offended. I will tell you about these classes. I hope they don't have classes like this now, but they did then. Welcome, Joy. Now you're going to get to hear about the Brahmachari class. Behind closed doors, the women, it's for the first time, it's being revealed to women what the men speak about in the temples, in their secret rooms behind closed doors when they have brahmacharya classes. I can't tell you what they say. You'll get offended. I can't say. Anyway. They talk about women in Brahmacharya class. Interesting, isn't it? They spend an hour talking about women. You would think if it was a Brahmacharya class, <laughs> they wouldn't be talking about women, would they? Interesting, isn't it? You find that funny? You can all laugh. I think that's pretty funny. Give me some funny faces. 
Isn't that funny? You 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 um, get a whole bunch of men together who want to be brahmacharis, and you spend an hour talking about women. That's funny. I think. I think it's one of the ironies of uh, the Hare Krishna movement. Anyway, so we would um, get together and um, talk about women. How bad they are. All the things wrong with them. You don't want to marry one of those. You don't want to marry one of those, do you? I mean, you know what women are like. They're selfish and they're and it's such, aside from that, you know, they may be nice. Some of them may be nice and sweet. If you're lucky, you might find one whose heart isn't like a razor and um, who's like a little bit emotionally controlled. You know, ladies, don't get offended. These Brahmacharya classes were led by like 22-year-old men who were trying to be celibate and having a really hard time. And the only way they could do it is say bad things about women. Don't take it personally. So, and if you find that one who's really nice and sweet and devotional, like Roma, or like Joy, or like Leslie, or like Pranapriya, and you have this really wonderful relationship, then it's just a dark well because you become so attached. You'll never get out of it. Hmm. Strange thing for men to talk about behind closed doors, isn't it? And all the women are going, Oh no, I know what they're talking about. I'll never find a husband because they're preaching to them not to get married. What am I going to do? Serious. This was like, you know, this was like a day in the life of an Iskan Mataji in like 1975. How many get married? The sannyasis are telling all the men to leave the temple and join them. There'll be nobody left but the Grihastas. What am I going to do? Serious, serious stuff. So, Sachinandan Swami gave one of these classes. And I can't tell you everything that the Brahmacharis would talk about in these classes because I don't know. Um, it's not even PG-13. So I don't want to talk about it. But, you know, the word sex comes up in the Bhagavatam. So, you know, that's discussed. So, after Sachinanda Swami gave the class, he said to a one man, he said, how'd you like it? The man said, oh Maharaj, you were talking about sex for the last hour. He said, I'm so much more agitated now than I was before you gave the class. What can be done? So, um, you know, you're. Um, I don't even know why I made that point. Someone tell me. Was it in relation to that associating with men who talk about women, or what was it? I completely lost my train of thought because I thought what I was talking about was pretty cool. So I just talked about. It. Who can tell me? See, I need I need people like around me now to tell me what I'm supposed to be saying because I forgot. Uh, <laughs> Today's prasadam, no, um, like uh, Roma says, I seem to be in a great mood. I'm, uh, I'm so um, like uh, burned out and overwhelmed that I just can't be too serious right now. Anyway, uh, it was related to association with negative people. Yeah. So even associating with positive people, talking about those things, look what it does. And that, you know, obviously negative people. What do negative people talk about? They talk about how much they drank, how many women they had relationships with, or men they had relationships with, what they did in those relationships. I mean, you know, you have to save yourself. So, part of Krishna consciousness, and, and, and which relates to this whole topic of getting a taste, part of Krishna consciousness is learning how to put yourself in a situation where you can taste Krishna consciousness. Associating with men attached to women is more detrimental, yeah. Watch out for those brahmacharya classes. They could be, uh, they could be really tough. No, Roma, actually, if you look at my old 
the earlier ones, like three years ago. Krishna.com. I was, I have to say honestly, I wasn't that serious. I mean, the topic was serious. I was serious, but I wasn't. I would joke a lot. And the reason was, I was doing a lot of seminars, and I'm, I joke in my seminars. So I would come back and joke on Krishna.com. Then I got serious like the last year. I was just like, wow, people are asking me for initiation. And I was like, whoa, I can't joke around. This is like serious. You know? I have to like look like a guru. I want to, it's a side story. This is really interesting. It's a whole other topic, but I, I want to tell you. Um, thank you, Bhaktin Kira. Um, I don't know if any of you know who Borijan Prabhu is. Borijan Prabhu spent six months a year in Vrindavan. He teaches at the VIHE. Now he's teaching the Bhagavatam. Any of you know him? He rarely comes to America. He came this summer. He was an incredible teacher, incredible devotee. Uh, amazing. And he has, he, he has disciples. Chosen very carefully, if you want to be his disciple. It ain't easy, Prabhus. It ain't easy. So he lives... Um, yeah, one who wrote the book on Japa. Yeah. What's the name of the book? Japa something? Meditations or something? And he teaches Japa. Like next month he'll teach. He does the Govardhan retreat with Satyananda Swami and Japa retreat with Satyananda Swami and Govardhan or Varshana. Yeah. Sometimes I'm... Um, sometimes I... I don't know. I like... I think... Krishna consciousness should be fun, so we can we can joke. Leslie, we can joke about all the bad things that went on. I mean, like what I describe is it's like pretty bad. You could get really I mean, you know, if you think about what was going on, you could get really angry about it if you're a woman, right? I mean, look what these guys are doing. What's going on in the movement? You know? so sometimes I just have to joke about it. Anyway, yes, she agrees. So, um, I was going to tell you a story. Interesting story. So, Bori John Prabhu, he's a guru. He doesn't have a lot of disciples. And he once said, he said, you know, I'm a Grihasta. I live six months a year in New Zealand and I just stay and, you know, I teach there. He said, but, he said, although I'm a guru, people don't see me as a guru because they think a guru is somebody who, like, flies in, gives a few classes and flies out. <laughs> usually a sannyasi and maybe someone who has a lot of disciples. He was joking. So I was I was discussing that with another devotee, you know, how like like a lot of times you see somebody not as who they are, but according to kind of like a profile. It's like a branding, you know, like, well, this is a this is a Volvo. The Volvo is better than the Ford. Everybody knows that. Of course now Ford owns Volvo. The, oh no, Ford owns Volvo. Oh, Volvo can't be good anymore. But you know that that little insignia on the car that says Volvo makes it look cool, or it says Mercedes or BMW it looks really cool. So it's kind of like a branding. So this one devotee said, "Yeah," he said, "You know, we have to get over this in our our movement, where devotees have to see that the guru is one who Krishna sends to them. You pray, you pray, you work on your bhakti." And you don't even have to look for a guru because, I mean, you shouldn't. But Krishna, out of your sincerity, will send you a guru. So he said, that's the real understanding of finding a guru. He said, that's what we need to teach devotees. Not that they see somebody and go, well, he's a guru. You know, so I should, you know, because he has, he looks like a guru. He walks like a guru. He talks, no, no, not like that. So then he told me this story. Really interesting uh, um, okay, we'll answer your question, Pranapriya. So he told me the story. This filmmaker, what he did, this is totally off the subject, but I have to tell you this because it's so interesting. What he did was, he got actors around him who played bodyguards. Then he got other actors around him who were paparazzi. And then he put on sunglasses. So he made this big show 
And I don't know where he was walking. Maybe it was in, you know, Manhattan or something. So he started walking down the street, right? And in a short period of time, you know, bodyguards and paparazzi, he had 300 people following him. And people asking him for his autograph. Oh, yeah, I saw you in that movie, this and that. Do you believe that? This is all on film, some documentary. And then, right, they all go away, takes off his sunglasses, and he walks down the street, and nothing happens. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Um, okay, now Pranapriya, she's worried because uh, three weeks after the Tawako workshop, she again is chanting bad, mind-wandering while chanting. Doubtful whether I will ever get a taste. Yes. Um, Rama, I didn't get it. Um, it just froze. Uh, did it freeze for anybody else? No, oh, okay, it's still good. Working properly. Uh, Rama didn't get it. In other words... This man created an image like he was some big person. And everybody was like, wow. And he wanted his autograph. They, they thought they knew him. Just as someone may appear like a guru and all these people, guru, guruji, you know. Sai Baba, this one, that one, everyone's bowing down. The boy jumper was saying, even in our movement, it's like somebody could be a guru, but people don't get it because it's not the one, it doesn't look exactly like what they conceive of a guru. That was his perspective. That, you know, people didn't see him as a guru because he wasn't traveling. He was in one place. Maybe he wasn't a sannyasi. And it was funny. Uh, refresh. Then she has to refresh. Okay, now it's back. So, uh, finally, yeah. Someone has to explain to Roma what that story means. So let's deal with Pranapriya. Okay, Pranapriya. What, so Pranapriya went to a workshop and she said three weeks she was getting a taste and now what has happened, Pranapriya, is you have gone back to your old default position. And why do you think your mind is wandering? Because your effort to make your japa a sacred activity to turn off all the light switches in your life when you chant. Okay, let's look at all the light switches you have on. You have on your creativity. You have on what you didn't finish yesterday. You have on what you have to do before you go to work. You have on what you're going to do at work. You have what you're going to buy on the way back from work. What your children are going to do. And when you're going to take your next vacation. And whatever else you have, each switch you turn off. Why do you turn it off? Because Krishna deserves your attention. And it's very, very important that you do that because you are giving your mind the license to wander. You are not in your japa house. You are chanting in the house of your life. You have to go in your house. And I would say for you, you need to go in a cave, a japa cave, and nobody can get in that cave but you. Now, do not be doubtful whether you'll ever get a taste because if you are doubtful, you're not going to make the effort to try to get the taste. And the doubt is going to block you. A devotee prays, Krishna, please give me a taste. And when you're chanting, you can be praying, Krishna, I have no taste. I had a taste. I lost my taste. Please give me a taste for your only name. Please, please, I beg, I beg. Give me a little drop of taste. What you can also think of is that the goal is to chant Shudhanam. The goal is not Aparad. And when we get into the world of Aparad, that's a dangerous world to be in. Never, never, ever, ever do you want to chant Aparad. Pranapriya, you should be afraid of Aparad. You should be frightened to chant Aparad. It should be like something you never, ever want to do. Just like I know, if you go to Vrindavan, you are very careful not to commit offense. And if you haven't gone to Vrindavan, when you go, you will be very careful. If you go on the altar, you are very careful not to commit offense. And so when you chant the holy name, you should be very careful not to commit offense. Right? Yes. 
don't just go, I can't do it, it's too hard. No. Be very careful not to commit offense. When you chant japa, you have turned your light out, you go out of your life, into your japa house, you read your affirmations, you pray to Krishna for a taste, and yes, you will get the taste. Don't ever give up. That is Maya's trick, because if she gets you to give up and say, I'll never get a taste, you know what happens? You don't get a taste. This happened to a devotee in Vancouver. She told me she went to a Japa workshop, but for the last six months, she was not getting a taste. And she said the same thing you said. She said, I don't think I can ever chant as well as I used to. And I said, you will, and we'll do it this weekend. At the end of the weekend, she said, I've chanted the best Japa of my life. It's all a matter of the effort, making the effort, proper attitudes, proper consciousness with which we chant. It's just when we don't do that, the default setting takes over and we chant the way we normally chant, which is not very good. We have to be afraid of chanting without taste because if we go on chanting without taste, what is going to happen in our life? Not much Krishna consciousness. And then you know what you're going to do? You're going to go, well, the chanting doesn't work. I'll just replace it with a lot of service or a lot of something. And then we try to, try to rationalize, well, it's okay if I do a lot of service if I don't chant well. It's a trap. I see it all the time. You don't want to go there. And that's where devotees go. Very important. You can do it. You just have to make it more of a priority. You have to. You can't allow your mind to 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 be alive when you chant. You just I go. Got to go in your japa cave when you chant. You just have to, have to, have to, have to. And when you make that effort, you know what Krishna does. He helps you. So if you say I can't get, I can't do it anymore. What you say? I, I will I ever get a taste? Of course you will, because Krishna will give it to you if you want it and you make the effort. And if you believe you can get it. So it's really important you believe it. Very important that you believe it. There's, it's, there's nothing more important than believing that you can get it and asking Krishna, please encourage me, give me a taste. Same thing for anybody who's, who's not getting a taste. I'm pointing my finger at you. I'm so fired up tonight. Pray to the Holy Name. Open your heart to the Holy Name. I'm going to write an article. I think my next newsletter room is going to be on this, if I get the time to write it. I want to write an article about how important it is to just open up to Krishna and say, Krishna, I'm chanting, I have no taste, just help me. Just like pour your heart out to the Holy Name while you're chanting. That's wonderful. Cry, I have no taste. Krishna, please. It's wonderful. You have a wonderful japa session. Just open your heart to Krishna. Go to your deities. Go to the temple. Open your heart. Tell Krishna, I have no taste. Please help me. Guide me. Give me intelligence. Just pour your heart out. Don't give up. And just No, it's not going to get better. Don't ever do that. Just pour your heart out. Krishna, I feel like it's never going to get better. Help me. What must I do? What's wrong? Why can't I do what I was doing three weeks ago? Pranapriya, this is to be expected. Don't give up. It's just sometimes you'll go up, sometimes you go down. But when you go down, don't give up. Just go back up. Okay? And then write me in a few days and tell me some good news about your job. Or whenever you get some good news, just write me and say, things are going better. Because they will go better if you make the effort. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, reading, reading. Um, sometimes it freezes. Uh, Rome is having trouble. It's back. Refresh. Okay. I'm trying. Okay. Kind of I'm trying. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You have to try. See, this is one of the principles we teach in the Japa workshop. The the one of the things that happens for many devotees that I see, my own self and others. So if I don't try that hard to chant well, it's it's not easy. Chant, you know, after six, eight rounds, you just kind of go into cruise control. Right? You ever do cruise control japa? It's just like you kind of give up trying. It's just a, uh, you know, just let the mind go and just chant. It's okay. You know, get your rounds done. You know, pull down your counter beads, another round, you know, whatever. Just, you know, it's not japa. Yeah, to the foreign groups and chant. Yeah, it's extremely important because in the group, you can discuss your challenges with your other group members. 
and you can work with the association of devotees. With what we did in Tawako, we did this. Uh, the temple president there had this idea. He said that we should form groups of six people and have one leader. And then after I go, what they'll do is they'll chant together on the phone because all everybody lives in a different place. They'll call one another and be on the phone. You can mute the phone if you don't want to hear everybody, but you'll know everybody's chanting and you're committed to a certain time. And then in the evening, you'll talk again and then you'll uh, not ch chant again, but you'll not talk again. You'll talk about what went wrong. Uh, oh, she's waking everybody up. That's good. Um, so uh, we can be together and then in the evening we can discuss what's going on with our job. But yeah. So... This thing about Sangha, Sangha is one of the most important things in Krishna consciousness. Because whatever we're not, we can get from somebody else. So yes, Sangha is extremely important. If you see or hear somebody chanting really well, you get inspired. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, you should sit next to somebody who's chanting Japa really well. So, of course, you don't always have the opportunity to do that. But if you ever do have that opportunity, do it. I told a story last year around Gaur Purnima, the GPC came. And I had just recently read that Bhaktivinoda Thakur had said that. So I saw Radhana Swami, he was coming every morning into the temple, chanting his rounds. So I said, might as well sit next to him, you know, absorb a little, you know. Of course, we're sitting, all senior devotees are sitting together. So, it's, it's, it's important. Sangha is so important. The sangha, sangha is mystical. It's magical and mystical, what happens in Sangha. What could never happen alone could, um, will happen in Sangha. The realizations will never get alone will happen in the Sangha. The strength will never get alone will happen in the Sangha. It's, just, it's mystical. You can take three weak devotees, put them together, and if they come together in a Sangha to advance in Krishna consciousness, to churn the ocean of nectar of Krishna consciousness, they can get so much Krishna consciousness from one another that they, that they just brought out from one another, that on their own wouldn't come out. Very important. <laughs> No, Ajinkya, Ajinkya says, this is what he said next to me. No, because I was inspired by your chanting. So you think that you're inspired by me, but I was inspired. You should see Ajinkya chant. It's amazing. Just to watch. If you just watch, if you ever have the opportunity to come to India and, and chant with Ajinkya, all you have to do is just watch him. And he's like, he's so relishing his japa that when you see him, you'll just want to chant like 108 rooms. I'm serious. Of course, I'm making him feel bad. Uh, and Ajinkya and I went to Bhaktivinoda Thakur's house. We sat in the room where Bhaktivinoda Thakur wrote books and chanted his job, and we chanted it. It's kind of nice, huh? So if any of you come to Mayapur, you just say, Mahatma Prabhu, can you take me to Bhaktivinoda Thakur's house? Can we go there and chant Japa? And I will say, yes. After Mangal Arti, we'll go. Take a boat across the Jalangi, we walk about a mile, we're, we're there. Let's just, let's do it. I'm inviting you all to Mayapur. Let's go there. We went not only to his room, we went to his samadhi. The, it had said that the Acharyas live in their Bhajan Kutirs and their Samadhi. He went to his Bhajan Kutir and his Samadhi. That they live there. You, you can experience their presence. Of course, you're experiencing it through, through your own, the realizations you get in your own feeling um, experience when you're there. I took a devotee once to Thakur Haridasa's Bhajan Kutir. So we were chanting Japa there after about 25 rounds. I said, we have to go. And the devotee said, I don't want to leave. So this is, these are the most amazing rounds I've ever chanted. I mean, it's just a powerful place. So when you go to India and you go to these Tirthas, you get special mercy. You get some kind of taste 
that you don't you don't normally get in your ordinary life. And it's very important because it makes a huge impression. I had this experience. So Divyangi One is buying his ticket to Mayapur right after the class. Um, I'll be getting to Mayapur at the latest, I think, November 5th. So, so get there by November 5th. On November 6th, we go to Bhakti and I'll, no, I'll be a mess. No, no, I'll be okay when I get there. I'll be stopping in Dubai, so I'll recuperate. So, um, you get, you experience the presence of an Acharya because they're there in their Bhajan Kutir. And you, you get all these inspirations and realizations. So I, I was once um, had this experience in Mayapur. I did kirtan in Navadvip, which is across the Ganga from Mayapur. We went for a few hours. You know, I was leading the kirtan, so I was chanting nonstop, maybe for, th- for three hours or something. And I came back to Mayapur, and I couldn't stop chanting. And I knew that was the gift of the Dham. But the reason I couldn't stop chanting was because I felt like there was nothing but the holy name. There was nothing in this world that had any attraction. And that's like not an ordinary experience. Not at all. I mean, I actually felt like this is it. What Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, there's nothing but the holy name in the 14 worlds. I actually felt, I had that experience for a few minutes. And when it was happening, I knew it was a gift. But that's, that's what it's like being in the Dhamma. You get, you get gifts which make Krishna consciousness more real and more powerful. I think I told this other story. I was um, chanting Japa in, in Prabhupada's Samadhi in Mayapur. And that morning when I went to Mangalartik and picked up my beads, I didn't have counter beads on my bead bag and I couldn't remember if I finished my rounds. It was just not good. How many rounds did I have left? Well, you look at your counter beads. I didn't have any counter beads. I hadn't used counter beads in 20 years. Just do it in my head. So I went to Prabhupada's Samadhi and he has a bead bag on his hand with counter beads. So I'm chanting and all of a sudden I see his counter beads moving. And I do a double take and I go, I must be dizzy. Actually I had my head down and I brought my I was chanting like this with my head down and then I brought my head up. So I thought maybe I just got a little dizzy. So I went down again and looked up, but the beads weren't moving. He said, interesting. Maybe Prabhupada's telling me to get counter beads. And then I went home. There were two devotees there. Probably like seven o'clock and one was packing up to leave. And I told them what happened. And this devotee said, you know, I'm just cleaning up and I have an extra pair of counter beads. Take them. So from not knowing how many rounds I chanted the day before to Prabhupada's Counter beads swinging to the devotee giving me his counter beads as soon as I got home. And I thought, okay, I'm in Mayapur. This is not that extraordinary in Mayapur. So the power of the Dham is special. You can get these kinds of experiences and realizations. And these kinds of experiences and realizations, if, see, if they go very deep, what is it? It, 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 um, it deeply ingrains the reality of Krishna consciousness, the power of it, the realization, and the faith. Because, because the experience of the Dham is faith building because you're going to get something there you don't ordinarily get. Now everybody's like, i got to get on the next plane to the Dham. Yes, you do. Maybe not the next one, maybe the one after the next. But you need to come. I'm actually going to do a tour, my wife and I. But um, anytime you come, we will take care of you. But you just have to come when I'm there because... I do travel a bit, even outside of India, while I'm in India, and I travel within India. So, um, call up your grandmother or grandfather or uncle or aunt and say, you know, I really have this desire to go to India, and I know you love me so much that you would buy me a ticket, and I would gratefully accept it. And Ajinkya is very fortunate because Within a matter, a short matter of time, he can be in Vrindavan in Mayapur. And um, who was it? Up- Upkrich, when he lives in Delhi, within a matter of three hours, he could be in Vrindavan. Anytime he wanted. Anytime he was free. Which is amazing, when you think about it. So, um, 
Okay. So, Leslie, see, if you come to India in February, then Joy's going to come in March, I think. Then you can meet Joy. And it's a real joy to meet her. Definitely. And then, Ajinkya will come. And then, when Roma finds out that you're all there, she's going to rob a bank and hop on a plane and she'll come. And who else is going to come? Well, um, who knows? Um, but Uskrit can go to New Vrindavan, so that's good. Um, that'd be nice. And then Pallavi, you know Pallavi is, she's there now. But she's not going to be there. She's only going to be there till December, so. Anyway. Okay, so, um, Prabhu Mataji's, I have some sad news for you. I'm leaving for India Monday. I'm arriving Tuesday, I don't know when, in Dubai. When you fly from America to India, you fly overnight. You sleep on the plane. I don't know, it's like 14 hours to Dubai. You sleep on the plane. So when you get there, it's like, you know, it's like your time, like two in the afternoon, so you're awake, but their time is like midnight. So you're completely thrown off. So, I mean, if I'm really thrown, and, and for me to give class 8 o'clock, Eastern, Eastern, um, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, be 4 a.m. Dubai time. So, and then I have to have a right, proper internet connection, which I assume we would get there. So, all I'm saying is a definite maybe, and then I will be there for the next Tuesday night, and then I will be back in Mayapur by the third Tuesday night. But my wife said we have wireless in Mayapur. So we have to see how fast it is and how it works, which is kind of amazing. That could solve the internet problem, but for me to do it in Mayapur it means I will be doing it at 5.30 in the morning, which is a really good time to change up. But since I love you all so much, I think I may just do it. So, um, we will keep you posted. Actually, all you have to do is... Uh, Paul of you is now in India, was sending emails to everyone on the list. But Roma can post it on my Facebook page. So if you check my Facebook page, we'll, we'll have an idea. But anyway, if you, just, if you just come on at this time, uh, uh, there two things will happen. One, I will tell somebody who can come on the live chat to tell you if I'm not there, that I'm not there, or if I'm going to be late or something, that I'll be there. Or of course, if you don't see me, because I'm pretty punctual, if you don't see me, like by five after eight, that just means it's not happening. Um, just try each Tuesday, because... Uh, yeah, and then for Roma it'll be better because um, no, it'll still be the same time for you. I, I, I might, then I might consider doing it another time. I was considering well, like Saturday morning Eastern Standard Time, but the problem is Saturday morning would be the problem is I do workshops on Saturday, so I couldn't do it every Saturday. I could do it on the days I didn't, but one or two a month, I'm, I'm Saturday doing a workshop. So that's the problem. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I appreciate, I think we um, discovered a few things tonight. I think this is a wonderful topic and I'm going to continue talking about it because uh, we still haven't scratched the surface surface so this week you'll have a you all have an assignment your assignment is to be happy in krishna consciousness to churn the ocean to relish krishna kata to relish the mellows and uh, that's your assignment pretty cool assignment isn't it thank you very much um, Pray that I get everything done before I go to uh, India. I've got papers on five desks, business to take care of. I was gone for 10 days before going. That was a real stretch. 
and uh, uh, I'll be. You know, I hope all I do is I hope I can fall. Asleep. I hope I get a little bit of sleep the night before I go. Um, so I'm halfway sane. But we're going to have some wonderful workshops in Dubai because the Dubai devotees are super enthusiastic. We're going to do one in Dubai and one in Sarja, which is a city about an hour and a half away in the United Arab Emirates. And then we're going to fly to Mumbai and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're going to do workshops. If you go to my uh, Facebook page at some point, we're going to tell you. If you just happen to be passing through Mumbai, like the first, second and third of November, there's a place called it Govardhan Eco Village, which was established by Radha Swami and his disciples. And they make their own bricks. They, they were building mud huts. So I hope I get to stay in a mud hut when I go. So cool. It's just mud and straw, everything. And old doors, the thrown away doors that they use. And uh, they're doing all kinds of cool things there. And I'll do some workshops up there. And... Uh, Oh, Jinky has been there. Yeah, it's wonderful. Okay, Prabhus, Matajis, um, have a good week, and we will see you when we see you. Hare Krishna.